Hello, everybody. It's a real pleasure to join you uh, this morning here in California, and I guess in the uh, uh, early evening in Turkey. This is actually the uh, third such lecture I've given to Turkish students, so I'm very pleased with the uh, how active uh, you are in this uh, new field of astrobiology and your interest uh, in the scientific uh, uh, story of how life began on the Earth. So I'm going to use this word, astrobiology, uh, which is a new scientific discipline that started up in 1996 when uh, NASA scientists uh, discovered that they were seeing something that looked like a microbial fossils in a Martian meteorite. <laughs> that turned out to be not totally convincing, so it's still a little bit up in the air, but at least it uh, started up this new uh, scientific discipline called astrobiology. So let me tell you a bit more about astrobiology. This is a way to think about evolution, not just happening on the earth in the biosphere, but in fact, as part of a much larger process that involves what we know about stars and planet formation and galaxies and uh, dust clouds that we call molecular clouds. And we have these two kinds of questions, one from the astronomy community, what are galaxies and stars? Why is stardust important? What are the biogenic elements? Well, how do solar systems form? And how did the Earth itself form? So I'm going to be touching on all of these questions in the first part of my talk today. Then we get to the biology portion of astrobiology. What organic compounds gave rise to the first forms of life? And of course, the big question, how did life begin? Now, I won't be able to tell you how life did begin on the Earth and perhaps even on Mars, because we just don't know enough yet. But what we do know is how life can begin, because we've unraveled a lot of the mystery about uh, how life can begin, uh, and we're now making uh, models of the origin of life in the laboratory and even out in the field in scientific research that we do at volcanic areas. So you'll be hearing a little bit about that as well. So those are the questions to keep in mind. Now, the next thing I want to uh, tell you about is my friend Stuart Kaufman, who's written a number of books that are relevant to the question today. And I want to particularly focus on a book that he wrote called At Home in the Universe the search for the laws of self-organization and complexity. Now, I've known Stu for many years. We go to meetings together and we trade ideas back and forth. Uh, and uh, this title of this book really is what my talk is about today, At Home in the Universe. At the end of my talk, I hope that you will feel more at home in the universe. And you will understand that life on Earth is a universal phenomenon that uh, takes advantage of so many things that we have now learned about stars and planets and the early Earth, in fact, that started up a little over four billion years ago. So keep that in mind. I hope that you, too, will feel at home in the universe just as I do. So let me give you a little bit more of a demonstration of what we mean by astrobiology. This is the evolutionary narrative of how stars give rise to life. Not that you never thought about that. What does life on Earth have to do with stars and the lifetimes of stars and the ashes of stars that we call stardust? Well, that's all part 
of this evolutionary narrative that I'm talking about today. So to define astrobiology in a nutshell, astrobiology starts with hydrogen and the Big Bang 13.7 billion years ago, when the universe was almost entirely composed of hydrogen and a little bit of helium, and that's all just hydrogen and helium that had not even formed stars yet for several uh, several uh, uh, 200 thousands of years before the first stars began to form. So hydrogen is a colorless, odorless gas that when given enough time changes into people. You and I and everybody listening to this is we are composed of stardust, and that stardust includes hydrogen gas, and the hydrogen in our body is left over from the Big Bang, and that's one of the things that you will learn about during my talk. And we then, our bodies, are something like 13.7 billion years old, 70% of your body, of the atoms in your body and mine, are as old as the universe. So you have to think of life on Earth as a kind of a pattern through which material from the rest of the universe is passing through in an organized process that we call life. So that is one of the big messages. We are part of the universe. So the way we study the universe is by telescopes. And the most recent telescope that uh, is giving us information is called the James Webb Space Telescope. It was launched uh, earlier this year. And that's what it looks like. The uh, sort of whitish layered structure underneath is a heat shield that protects the telescope from sunlight. And then that yellow thing in the middle is a reflective mirror that bounces infrared light and also some uh, ordinary light uh, off of that mirror into a receptor, which is off to the left there, uh, held up by these two struts that you see. And that receptor then takes an image, takes uh, when, uh, when essence, essentially a photograph of what the telescope is looking at. I'm going to show you a few of these photographs because they have to do with what uh, we're going to be talking about today. So uh, it was launched uh, earlier this year. It was. Uh, it took about a month to unfold the telescope because it had to go up in a rocket. It's all folded up. And then just amazingly, it was able to unfold flawlessly into a working telescope that is now called the James Webb Telescope. It has a hot side, uh, which is protected by that shield, and it has a cold side, which is right down at the temperature of outer space. And that's very important to be keep it cold because this is an infrared telescope. It's looking at uh, infrared light rather than uh, uh, ordinary white light uh, that uh, the other telescopes use. So the telescope turned on two, three months and began to send us back images. Here is one of the very first images that sent back. It's quite extraordinary. They painted the Webb telescope out at a relatively empty portion of uh, our Milky Way. We, of course, our planet is a member of the galaxy we call the Milky Way. And those uh, stars that have little... Uh, hexagonal beams coming off of it. Those are uh, stars in our galaxy. So we're looking beyond those nearby stars. And what do we see but galaxies? Our universe is filled with billions of other galaxies. So we're not alone in the universe. Our galaxy is just a fairly ordinary galaxy, one of several hundred billion that we now know exist in our universe. The Webb telescope, by the way, is going to let us see galaxies that are ancient, 
uh, we're going to go back over 10 billion years in time. And all of those galaxies that we're looking at right now are, in fact, in that age range of uh, several billion to uh, as many as 10 billion years. So this lets us look back in time. Here's a wonderful image of four galaxies that are relatively close together. The white stuff that looks like a mist is actually billions of stars that are part of these, these galaxies. And they seem to have gone through a kind of a collision. Notice there's a, uh, they're not ordinary kind of spiral galaxies, but they're somewhat deformed because of this collisional process. So that's, uh, that was a beautiful image. You can see a lot of reddish material, and those are relatively young new stars forming uh, in these galaxies. And you're going to see a lot of that as we go on here. So here is a nearby galaxy called M81. And this is what our galaxy, the Milky Way, would look like if we could see it from outer uh, beyond the uh, stars in our galaxy, looking back at it. You notice uh, some uh, bluey stars around the rim. Uh, those are uh, stars that are relatively new. They're still uh, giving off a bluish light. And you'll also see dust clouds, that brownish stuff around the uh, central part of the galaxy. That dust is very important to the origin of life on Earth because that dust is what gives rise to new planets. So four and a half billion years ago, our planet, the Earth, formed in a solar system, a, a relatively new solar system with a relatively young sun. And the dust then gave rise to the planets, the nine planets of our solar system. This is a gravitational accretion. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about that as we get farther along in my talk. Then toward the center of the galaxy, you see yellowish stars. They really are uh, yellowish because uh, they happen to have compositions and ages that give it a yellow, yellowish tinge. And again, you can kind of see the dust clouds. Those are the ashes of stars that have gone through their lifetime and exploded and and uh, blew their dust off, the former compounds in the stars blown off into interstellar space. And then it just circulates within the galaxies. And that dust is what gives rise to new stars and new planets. We just know that for a fact, because we can now see that happening with our better telescopes. <clears throat> this one is only 10 million light years away. And uh, the Webb telescope is going to be able to see things that are 10 billion light years away. So you can see this uh, range of possibilities that we now have with the James Webb Telescope. Here's another magnificent uh, initial image from the James Webb Telescope. It is a wall of dust that is in one of the nearby uh, molecular clouds that we now know give rise to new stars and solar systems. So keep in mind <clears throat> that this is the remains of stars that have gone through their lifespan and died and then blew up in a nova or supernova explosion. And the remains of that star are now um, out in outer space as these molecular clouds. And by the way, there are organic molecules in these dust clouds. And that is also part of the story that you're going to hear today, because those organic molecules are were being delivered to the Earth four billion years ago to help life get started. And they are still being delivered today. So we know that we can get organic molecules from extraterrestrial sources. That's part of the story of how life could begin on the Earth. So that's a very important thing for you to understand. Uh, that's our portion of being at home in the universe, is all of this stardust from which new stars and planets emerge. 
So here's a beautiful image that was the, one of the Hubble telescope images, and we've now seen it with the web as well. Uh, the astronomers that first saw this called it Pillars of Creation. This is in the Eagle Nebula, and they're called uh, Pillars of Creation because in this in the nebulas you can see those little red dots. Uh, see if I can point at these. I'm not sure whether you can see what I'm doing, but these little red dots here are in fact new stars forming within the molecular cloud, new stars and solar systems. And up here is another sort of a, uh, a reddish area where the starlight is illuminating that dust. And up here, there are stars that have formed behind the dust cloud. And you can sort of see rays of light uh, coming through the, around the edges of the dust cloud. So that is where new stars came from and are coming from today as I speak. So we have one of those dust clouds very near us. And you're going to learn a little Greek mythology here because uh, Orion was a hunter in Greek mythology. And when the uh, ancient Greeks looked up at the constellations in the sky, they thought they saw a group of stars that reminded them of Orion the hunter. So off to the right, you can see the shield of uh, Orion. You can see the body of Orion here. This is the belt of Orion. And here's a couple of legs of Orion. And that name is still used today. And I'm going to show you something in the Orion uh, constellation uh, that is very much part of our story. So there are just the stars of the Orion uh, constellation, and you can see that. It's up in the sky right now. What you might not be able to see with the naked eye is Betelgeuse. Right here is a star with an Arabic name, Betelgeuse. And it was used as a title of a movie. Maybe some of you saw this uh, funny movie called Betelgeuse. Well, that is actually a red star, red giant star that is up here in one of the arms of the Orion constellation. Here's the belt. And if you look just below the belt, you can see a nebula. That's the Orion Nebula. And that is a molecular cloud. And within the Orion Nebula, we can see new stars forming. We looked at that with the Hubble telescope. It's another of our wonderful satellite telescopes that's been going around the Earth. And here is the Hubble image of the Orion Nebula. And within the image, you'll see little squares, tiny squares that are then magnified. And each magnified image shows you a new star with stardust around it. Here's another new star, uh, the upper part of it, a uh, new star with stardust. Down here is another new star. And all of these we can see uh, in magnified view of these little tiny red dots that we see in the Orion Nebula. So we are looking at new stars forming in these molecular clouds. And that's a very important part of our story because that is where our Earth came from. And we also know that in the Orion Nebula, the stardust there is full of organic compounds. And you're going to learn about those because when we get to the origin of life, those are the compounds that are, are available. So here is that amazing fact <clears throat> that I already alluded to a little bit earlier, and that is that 70% of life's atoms are as old as the universe. So you are ancient. You are 13.7 billion years old if we think about the hydrogen atoms in your body. Those are left over uh, from the origin of the universe. And here we are, life on the earth, using those atoms. What I didn't tell you about is the other 30%. Those are the biogenic elements, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. These are 99% of uh, the atoms that are in living cells. We call them the biogenic elements because they give rise to life 
and they are more than 5 billion years ago old because they were made in stars which went through their lifespan, they blew up and then distributed these elements into interstellar space. They were brought to the earth by gravity and that is where we think what gave rise to life on the early earth 4 billion years ago, the biogenic elements. Okay, I'm gonna show you that process. Here's the periodic table showing now where these, elephant, where these elements come from. Now the green ones, carbon and nitrogen, are mostly from dying low mass stars. And that is our sun. Five billion years from now, five billion years from now, our sun will explode and become a red giant and then turn into a white dwarf. So that we're now watching carbon and nitrogen being synthesized by stellar nucleosynthesis in our sun, just as they are in all of these low mass stars that are sun-sized. Some stars though, go through a supernova phase. These are exploding massive stars and they give rise to these other elements because these take higher temperatures to form. Oxygen, sulfur, and phosphorus are uh, the uh, elements that would have to become from these exploding massive stars. Now, amazingly, we now know that merging neutron stars, that's all the purple ones you see there, are absolutely essential. They merge and they explode. They become gamma ray sources briefly, but that's where these really heavy elements, such as gold, for instance. Here's you're probably wearing a little bit of gold jewelry. That was once part of merging neutron stars that give rise, we know now from nuclear physics, that that is where those purple ones come from. So isn't it amazing that we can now trace essentially all of the periodic table, except for hydrogen and helium that were present at the Big Bang. Everything else that you see was made by stellar processes uh, uh, and then distri uh, distributed in an interstellar space when the stars died. So let's think about what those stars look like when they die. Uh, the first thing that happens when they run out of hydrogen to turn into helium by nuclear fusion is they collapse, they get much hotter, way up into a million degree, 10, 100 million degrees, 10 times the temperature of an ordinary star. Finally, uh, you begin to produce these heavier elements that, are re that require these very high temperatures to be synthesized. And those then are part of an explosion and distributed into interstellar space as dust. So those molecular clouds I told you about are the products of stars that have exploded. And we know that because we can see stars that, that that has happened to. One of these is going to be our sun. This is the future, the past and the future of our sun. The sun came into life, was born, so to speak, about four and a half billion years ago. It's gone through 4.5 billion years of time, just more or less as it is now, and it's got another several billion years before it begins to literally run out of gas. It will become a red giant, briefly, which then collapses with all of this stuff getting blown off into outer space and ends up as a white dwarf. And the white dwarf goes on for billions of years. Uh, there are lots of white dwarfs in our galaxy. These are stars that have gone through this process. Now we're going to look at a, a one of these nebulas, a planetary nebula, uh, that is the remains of a star. Here it is. We see lots of these now with the Hubble and with the James Webb Telescope. This particular one is called the Cat's Eye Nebula, and you're going to see why we call it that. Here's the what is going to be a white dwarf. It's uh, collapsed from being an ordinary star like our sun. And all of this stuff coming out are layers 
of dust uh, that contain all the elements that used to be in the star. And these are getting off, blown off into inter interstellar space. So that is what makes up the molecular clouds to give rise to new stars. So why is it called the cat's eye nebula? Well, the fact is that uh, if you discover this for the first time, you get to name it. So the astronomer who first saw this said, okay, that looks like a cat's eye to me. Well, here's a real cat's eye, and it doesn't look much like that nebula until I let you see what it looks like in an actual cat. There it is. So that's how it got its name, the cat's eye nebula. And there's a whole bunch of others. If I had more time, I'd show you dozens of these with uh, odd little names just based on what they kind of look like. So that was the cat's eye nebula. Here's another couple of nebulas. This is just a dust cloud relatively nearby. And off to the left, you can see a reddish area within that cloud. And you kind of see some stuff getting blown off. This is, in fact, a new star being born. This is going to turn into a solar system over several billion years of time. But up here to the upper right, you're going to see why it gets the name that was given to it. Now, I put those eyes in just to make you realize that this is called the Goblin Nebula. So I like to show this around Halloween when, when uh, I give this kind of a talk in uh, October 31st. So that's the Goblin Nebula. And someday, if you become an astronomer and discover one of these nebulas, you can name it whatever you want, whatever it looks like to you. Okay, there is a telescope down in the Atacama Desert, in the uh, Chilean Atacama Desert, and it's called ALMA, A-L-M-A. I won't give you the, that's just an abbreviation for what uh, the telescope has uh, got a longer name. But this is one of the first images of a solar system being formed. So here's what we call a proto-sun. This is called a protostellar disk. And that disk, you can see it begin to accrete by gravitational energy into planets. So this is area here around the star is going to become a new planet. This, of course, takes tens of millions of years to happen. But uh, this is really what our solar system looked like four and a half billion years ago. Now, planet formation <clears throat> is amazingly violent. And uh, it is a process by which chunks of um, matter called, um, called planetesimals crash into each other and produce a ever-growing planet such as our Earth. Now, in our solar system, our Earth is the only planet that was hit by another planet. It gave rise to our moon. So here we see something that happened about 4.4 billion years ago. Uh, this uh, Mars-sized planet crashed into uh, the proto-Earth, and a chunk of the Earth was blown away into outer space surrounding the Earth and gave rise to the moon by a process of gravitational accretion. So here is our moon. These, of course, are all artistic renditions. Here is our moon still being bombarded by large chunks uh, that uh, were part of its formation. And wherever one of those asteroid-sized uh, uh, planetesimals hit, uh, it would leave a mass of glowing yellow-hot lava. These turned into the seas and craters that you can see on the moon today. So right up here is the Copernicus crater, named after a early astronomer, uh, Copernicus, that uh, lived back in the 1600s. Here's the Tycho crater, another earlier astronomer. Then all of those darker areas at one time were seas of lava, red hot. And that's where, of course, we like to land lunar landers because uh, you wouldn't want to try to get land in one of these uh, much rockier uh, areas uh, 
that were left over from the uh, formation of the moon. So these are called mares, or the Latin word for seas. So that's our moon. And this is the biggest moon in our solar system in relation to its planets. It's got the biggest ratio of size. So that's part of our story too, because uh, we now know that this process is still occurring. Every one of those blue lines is an Earth-crossing asteroid left over from the beginning of the solar system. So you'll see the orbits of Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, and you can see how some of those orbits of asteroids, the, the light blue lines, cross the orbit of the Earth. And every once in a while in the Earth's history, one of those hits, such as the uh, six, six mile, 10 kilometer object that hit in the Yucatan Peninsula 66 million years ago and wiped out all of the dinosaurs and allowed us, the mammals that were alive at that time, to go through to the next phase of evolution on Earth. So it's still happening. Here is one that uh, landed. I won't show you this. They're just These are the orbits. And here is one that came into the Earth's atmosphere in your lifetime. This is just uh, 2013, February 2013. It hit the atmosphere of the town of Chelyabinsk in Russia. And it came in, exploded, and the shock wave blew out windows all over this little town. And, and uh, thousands of people were injured because they saw this flash of light. Uh, they went to the window to see it was, and suddenly the shock wave blew the windows into their faces and uh, uh, you know injured them pretty seriously, some of them. So that is what it looks like when a uh, small asteroid, this is about, oh, maybe 10 tons of matter coming in, uh, and producing this flash of light. And this is what's left over. This is five tons of extraterrestrial dust, dirt, dust added to the Earth uh, just a few years ago. So that is how the Earth formed, by these large objects like this, this relatively small one, hitting the uh, growing Earth uh, four and a half billion years ago and allowing the Earth to grow to its present size, along with that moon-forming event. So this is why we are so confident about, confident about the story that I'm telling you, because it's still happening today. Now we're going to talk about the origin of life. This is what the Earth looked like uh, around 4 billion years ago. There's no life yet. Uh, this is when uh, we call this the prebiotic Earth. And uh, there were volcanoes rising from a uh, global ocean. Uh, the uh, atmosphere was mostly nitrogen, just like today, a little bit of carbon dioxide, but there was no oxygen because there was no plant life. There was nothing making oxygen that we have today uh, on the uh, contemporary Earth. There were volcanoes with a lot of volcanic heat. Uh, there was a salty sea. Uh, very much like the ocean today. And because there was a volcano rising out of the sea, we had a source of fresh water. And that's very important to the story I'm going to tell you. We in my laboratory, my research, are proposing that an alternative to life beginning in the ocean in a salty seawater was freshwater ponds on volcanic land masses. And that's a very plausible alternative to the idea that life somehow began in seawater deep in the ocean. So uh, we're in kind of a controversy here, and you'll hear my side of that story as I go a little further here. But keep in mind that there were volcanoes on the early Earth, and there was precipitation. So that meant that there was distilled water, rainwater, uh, falling as rain on these volcanic land masses. So let's think about all the water in the world today. Imagine that we have taken all of the water in the ocean 
and put it into one big drop. So that big drop of water you see on the left is all of the ocean water in one drop. <laughs> it doesn't look like much. And the fact is the ocean is only about uh, four or five kilometers deep so on average, spread over the earth. And you can see that this, the artist showed this all dried up. Now see the little uh, blue dot to the right of the large drop. That's all the, the, all the um, fresh water on the earth, but it's mostly in Antarctica and on Greenland. These are the frozen ice of uh, Antarctica and Greenland. That's that little tiny uh, drop off to the right of the big drop. So what about the water that is actually liquid? Behind, under, underneath the, uh, the small drop to the right of the big drop, you can see a little tiny blue dot. That is the water that is actually in rivers and lakes. It's not much, but that is where we think life began. And I'm going to give you that story. That's research that's going on right now. So, so life began by assembling organic molecules. The question is, where did those organic molecules come from? There had to be nucleotides that were somehow polymerized in nucleic acids. There had to be amino acids. They are somehow polymerized into forming peptide bonds of proteins uh, on the early Earth. Finally, there had to be amphiphilic molecules like soap that would form membranes, membrane compounds, because you must have cellular membranes if you're going to have an origin of cellular life. So let me tell you where we think a lot of those organic compounds came from. This is a field near Murchison, Australia in 1969. And this is not really that field. This is a field showing what it would have looked like in 1969 in Australia. The townspeople in Murchison were startled when a huge white light came into view and exploded and dropped meteoric fragments all over the town of Murchison. So up to the upper left, you can see Murchison. This is just a little community. A few tens of thousands of people live there. And all of these red dots that you see are places where chunks of the meteorite fell. And they were quickly collected by townspeople and by scientists, Australian scientists, rushed to the scene because this was a carbonaceous meteorite. We now call it the Murchison meteorite that left 100 kilograms of fragments fallen into the fields around Murchison, Australia. Now, I've studied about three of these uh, that came through my lab going back to the uh, <clears throat> 1980s. This is one of these fragments. It's about uh, the size of a golf ball. I broke it open so as you can see the inside. Now, the material of this meteorite is as old as the Earth, at least. Probably some of it is even older. Uh, those uh, yellow, the white things and some of the yellow things are little pebbles that were part of the dust that surrounded the sun four and a half billion years ago. And that accreted into asteroids, which are still circling uh, beyond the orbit of Mars. And the asteroids are the source of meteorites like this. The asteroids are colliding with each other, and they give off fragments that fall to the Earth. And then that's where we get something that is four and a half bi billion years old. So that's, that's what it looks like. We and others have analyzed this. We now know that carbonaceous meteorites have a little over 1% organic carbon, but most of that is an insoluble polymer called kerogen. And kerogen means it's something like coal, and uh, it's a polymer of polycyclic compounds, and it's not really very interesting. What is interesting are the soluble organics in this meteorite, and that about half of those are carbar carboxylic acids, and you can see uh, uh, amino acids, that's about 10% of the soluble material. There are other organic compounds such as 
oily hydrocarbons, aliphatic and aromatic. There's aldehydes, alcohols, and even some purines like adenine. Adenine is one of the bases of nucleic acids, and it is coming in with this uh, meteorite. So these are the compounds required for the origin of life. And the way that we're thinking about the, this now is that these compounds fell onto volcanic land masses and were somehow undergoing chemical reactions that led to the beginning of life. And I'm going to show you research that we're doing right now about this kind of material. So the question is, the first question is, how did organic compounds begin to self-assemble, not just in the laboratory, but also out in natural conditions? So over the years, I visited volcanoes all over the uh, earth. And one of these was in Kamchatka, uh, which is a uh, peninsula coming down off of eastern Russia. I've been to Hawaii, Iceland, New Zealand. Most recently, just a couple of years ago, we were working in New Zealand and a volcanic area. And what we do in those areas is to learn from them because we think that they are like the primitive earth. So we call this a prebiotic analog. We go to there to learn what it was really like on the early earth. And I'm going to show you Kamchatka, which is one of our best places to go, because Kamchatka is full of volcanoes, and the volcanoes sterilize the uh, Kamchatka uh, uh, sites uh, where volcanism occurs, and that means that there's no other life there except what we want to measure. So you're going to see one of the experiments I did there. So Kamchatka is this sort of a peninsula going off of eastern Russia. It's very primitive. Only a few tens of thousands of people live there. Uh, they mostly live in a little town called Petropavlovsk, which is where we fly to. So to get there, we hop in a plane in San Francisco. We land in Anchorage, Alaska. We then next morning hop on a Russian plane that takes us across the Bering Sea to Petropavlovsk. And here is Petropavlovsk, and here are the volcanoes that line the uh, eastern uh, side of Petropavlovsk. There's dozens of these active volcanoes. This is the most volcanic area on the Earth, right on Kamchatka. So we land in Petropavlovsk. We get on a, um, a Russian troop carrier that is now delivering tourists and scientists to Mount Matnaski. This is one of these uh, volcanoes that is uh, one, of, one of the string of volcanoes in Kamchatka. So we're going to land here and we'll go down to Mount Matnaski. This is what it looks like out the window as you land in Petropavlovsk. This is the Koryatsky volcano, and that's the nearest one to this city. It's relatively quiet now. It's not actively erupting. So Petropavlovsk is kind of safe from a eruption. But Mount Matnoski is not. This is an active volcano, and every few years it erupts, and we went there between eruptions. I've been there twice. And uh, we're going to go down this road from uh, Petropavlovsk. We're going to go off-road here, and we're going to camp right around here. Then we're going to climb up into the crater of Mount Matnoski. And here I am now, in the crater, this is a uh, little boiling puddle called Darwin's Hot Little Puddle. The reason we call it that because Darwin in 1871 speculated that life may have begun in what he called a warm little pond. Well, we think a better place is a warm little puddle. So we call this Darwin's Hot Little Puddle. Well, what am I doing there? What am I pouring into that puddle? I'm pouring a mixture of amino acids and nucleobases, adenine, uracil, guanine, and cytosine. I'm pouring in a amphiphilic molecule, a 14-carbon fatty acid. That's why it's got this white milky uh, color. There's some glycerol in it, phosphate. And this pool is mildly acidic because of uh, sulfur dioxide that is part of all volcanic emissions. And we're going to watch what happens to these molecules. 
So what happens that right away is that the fatty acid forms membranes which aggregate around the rim of this pool. And it's obvious that this pool, like all volcanic puddles, goes through wet, dry cycles. Down here in the lower right, you can see a dry rock. That white part is dry. Uh, around the rim of it, you can see that it's still moist. So these wet, dry cycles are unique to freshwater hydrothermal pools in volcanic areas. We think that that's where life can begin. The reason is that it becomes concentrated there. And if there is a membrane forming compound, we will see cellular structures beginning to form around the edge of the pool. And then it gets dry as this water evaporates and then it gets wet again when the next rainstorm comes along. So that's what we call a wet dry cycle. And we now know that polymerization occurs in those wet dry cycles. That's what we're doing in the laboratory right now. We're producing nucleic acids like RNA simulating the wet dry cycles that go on in pools like this. And those polymers get encapsulated in membranes to give rise to protocells. And we can watch this happening both in the laboratory and in pools like this. And that is what is in our publications. Now you might ask how a big molecule like nucleic acid could get into those membranes. Well, suppose that we have small and large molecules like nucleic acids and these little uh, round things I show you down here. That's imaginary uh, molecules like RNA or DNA or whatever else, any proteins you want. This all works. It turns out that if you add amphiphilic molecules to the to this solution and then dry it out, that it fuses, the, the vesicles fuse into a multilamellar structure. And we can actually watch this happen by electron and light microscopy. Then when it, the next wet cycle comes along, the molecules, no matter how big they are, they can be as big as a protein or nucleic acid, they are now inside the vesicles. Now, if you want to convince yourself that this really works, it's simple. Any one of you could do this if you have a little bit of DNA in the lab and a little bit of a soap-like molecule like decanoic acid. This is a 10-carbon monocarboxylic acid. What we did here is to dry down the decanoic acid vesicles with the DNA. We then stained the DNA with a fluorescent dye, and you can see the DNA captured inside these vesicles and glowing. So we call that a protocell, and that is the main story that you should take home. We can now make protocells by wet-dry cycling in simulations and in the real natural conditions of volcanic hydrothermal uh, areas. Okay, let's uh, finish up now. Hydrothermal systems are conducive to self-assembly processes. The reason is that those freshwater lacustrine, that just means like a lake, lacustrine environments, lakes and ponds, they promote self-assembly of amplophiles in their primitive cellular structures. We don't think that life began in the ocean. What we're telling you could not occur in ocean water. There's no such thing as a wet dry cycle, for instance, in the deep ocean. Furthermore, we know that the salty conditions inhibit the process. This is what we think the early earth looked like. It's a little video we made. There were hot springs, there were geysers, uh, just like in uh, these volcanic areas have geysers. Yellowstone National Park is full of geysers. These geysers produce splashes. Splashes go through wet dry cycling. Uh, the uh, water that comes out of the geyser flows downhill. It's got organic materials in it. All of those little ponds that you see there are going through wet dry cycles that we've watched happen. And as the wet dry cycling occurs, we get uh, polymerization reactions and the polymers are captured 
in uh, uh, within vesicles. So I'm going to finish up now by showing you this process. Here's an inland hydrothermal field, just like in the video. There's uh, that's Bumpus Hill. That's here in California. That's one of our field sites we work in, and that's what we use to model this video. And those go through these uh, cycles of uh, wet, wetting and drying. And then as it dries, a film of this material gets dry on the mineral surface. As it dries, polymerization happens. Those red things are little polymers, or uh, you can see the polymerization now being captured between layers of lipid. There's an electron micrograph showing the layers so we know happens just because we can see it by electron micrographs. Here are the vesicles budding off. This is when it gets wet again. The vesicles have uh, the polymers now encapsulated, and we can see those vesicles again by electron microscopy. This is what they look like in the lower right. And uh, then those vesicles, some of them are relatively stable and others are not. So they are undergoing evolutionary selection. Here, some of them you can see are unstable and they pop and the polymers and the amplifiles just go back to be recycled. But others happen to have polymers that help the vesicles to be stable. And maybe the polymers have catalytic activity they will be stable and they might have catalysts that could help primitive metabolism begin. They might be able to replicate. We are now trying in the laboratory to get these polymers to replicate using the wet dry cycle as an energy source. These ideas were published in Scientific American for the first time. You can probably find that online. This is uh, August of uh, 2017. And um, we are now finishing up. This is my last slide. We have an alternative scenario. Life began in freshwater hydrothermal pools with wet dry cycles. Life did not invent nucleic acids. Instead, polymers were being synthesized by uh, these wet dry cycles that we've told you about. They were encapsulated in lipid membranes to form protocells. Each protocell is like a microscopic experiment uh, trying to find out how to become alive. They undergo selection and evolution. And the proposed alternative is that life began when selected systems of encapsulated polymers emerged that were capable of catalyzed metabolism, growth, and replication. Here is what it uh, looks like. This is a summary of everything I told you about. Organic compounds are synthesized on dust in the protostellar nebula. They're delivered by infall uh, as they are still being delivered today. Uh, they accumulate in hydrothermal sites on volcanic land masses. They undergo wet dry cycling in these hydrothermal pools and you end up with protocells which can undergo selection and evolution. So that's the end of my story. I hope I haven't gone over in the time you have available, but if uh, there is extra time, I'm happy to take uh, take um, questions. Uh, in the periodic table, you showed that the sources of the uh, elements, there were, uh, the question was from uh, Suleyman Inge, and he said there were seven colors, but only six of them were explained uh, the, where the uh, elements come from. Okay, um, I'll just tell you the steps here. We know for a fact from uh, radio astronomy that organic material is present in the molecular clouds. We know for a fact that the molecular clouds can turn into planets and that organic material is carried along during planet formation. However, it gets, because of the temperature of planet formation, all that organic material is gone. It gets, turns into carbon dioxide. Uh, therefore, there must be an infall of more organic material. The major infall of organics 
is on dust particles. And meteorites and comets that hit the Earth back then are only a minor com component uh, being uh, organic compounds. So most of it is on in the dust particles that uh, are part of the accretion process. That is still happening today. 30,000 tons of dust right now are being added per year to the Earth's mass. So accretion is still going on. Organic material is still falling to the Earth from extraterrestrial sources. Meteorites are concentrated examples of the organic material. And that organic material then is brought into the solar system on the surfaces of the dust particles and then become part of the planetesimals and the asteroids that give rise to uh, the planets. Now, I hope that answered the question as I understood it. Yeah, I saw the question from the chat. If the question, uh, the answer wasn't clear, the person who asked can uh, ask it again. And we can take other questions meanwhile. Uh, Tuna Yilmaz asks, firstly, excuse my lack of research. However, I do have a question. Recently, a galaxy that is older than universe more than 13.7 billion years has been found. What is your opinion on this topic? Oh, uh, I don't have a knowledgeable opinion about an older galaxy. Uh, it would be a surprise, and perhaps uh, this is the James Webb found uh, a very distant galaxy. It would have to be something that we actually see. We would have to be able to measure light from it because we use the uh, red shift to uh, determine the age of the, um, of the galaxy. So if it's older, I'll bet that it's not a lot, lot older, uh, maybe just uh, you know a little bit older than what we have known before. So it's almost certain that we will see things a little bit older because we're making discoveries using the James Webb that we could never have done before. We have one more question coming from Ahmed Tumut. Why did we specify this little hot lakes to be made out of non-salty water? Oh, okay. So these lakes, these volcanic ponds are non-salty. That's right. The reason is that they're being formed by precipitation of rain or snow in the case of uh, Kamchatka. And this is evaporated. It is water distilled from the salty ocean. And not much else dissolves in it. Way, it's way down in the millimolar concentration range, uh, dissolving from the surrounding minerals. So that, if that was the question, uh, this is simply rainwater. So it's very low in ionic salts. Uh, Tina also asks something else. Uh, thank you for the answer of my previous question. Also, uh, you have mentioned the dry and wet cycle. Do we yeah. have an idea what was the situation on raining? I mean, uh, would primal earth allow that? Because if I remember correctly, things were simple, put it, more wet. Okay, the question was about wet dry cycles, uh, but I didn't understand the part of the question about the, the, the actual question. So uh, give me that one more time. He asked, do we have an idea of what was the situation on raining? He asked about wet and dry cycle. Um, well, let me tell you about what we actually yes, yes, see. Yes. That what we yes, actually yes. see is several kinds of wet dry cycles. There's a very rapid one, which is splashing of the water from geysers and hot springs. There's sort of a boiling splashing. So those are minutes in length. There are longer ones that have to do with evaporation of small pools. They can rapidly evaporate a few liters of water would evaporate in a matter of some hours to a few days. Then we have a very long-term evaporation 
of larger ponds that uh, take uh, actual uh, rainstorms, which would come through every several weeks. And that is a much longer wet dry cycle. So we don't know which of these was most important. But in the laboratory, our simulations are just with maybe a tenth of a milliliter of solution. And the evaporation occurs in uh, within a minute or two. And then we sort of have a temperature, uh, uh, elevated temperature that drives the actual polymerization process. So I hope that that covered, <laughs> covered the question. Uh, this, the internet is not very good at uh, getting, um, you know, precise uh, sounds across. So I'm sorry for the trouble I'm having. But keep going. I want to try to answer questions if you have them. Professor, I have a question of my own. Okay. Uh, so you talked about uh, vesicle formation uh, with the polymerization inside. So when, with the dry and wet cycles, how does the uh, vesicle formation get affected? Does the already formed vesicles get uh, disadvantages with the dry cycle? Okay, yeah, it's a good question. Um, the fact is that some properties of life can occur spontaneously. Most of the things that a living system uh, does in terms of its functions are driven by energy, but membrane formation is not one of these. Membranes are a spontaneous self-assembly of amphiphilic compounds like soaps or like uh, phospholipids, for instance, that are in the biological membranes. And this is a spontaneous process. Uh, everybody who's listening to this has actually made spontaneous membranes because you have blown soap bubbles as children. A soap bubble is a spontaneously formed membrane from an amphiphilic compound that we call soap. And a soap is just a, uh, a short uh, monocarboxylic acid. You know, they start at about 10 carbons in length, going up to maybe 18 carbons that are part of biological uh, soaps. So fatty acids are just part of membranes. And in biological membranes, they are turned into phospholipids. Uh, so that is what our living membranes are like. But there was no fossil lipids on the early Earth because there's no metabolism. So that meant that we had to have a source of membranes that is not a metabolic source. Uh, years ago, I extracted the Murchison meteorite, and I discovered that there are soap-like molecules in the Murchison meteorite that can form membranous structures. So we know for a fact that membranous compounds are being delivered today, and we assume that the same compounds were being delivered on the early Earth. Uh, now, the, the membranes are not solids, they're not as though they're made of proteins or nucleic acids. They're made of individual lipid molecules that are held together by non-covalent forces. Therefore, they're fragile, just like a soap bubble is fragile. And uh, if you have uh, some uh, a soapy solution, let's say you have some soap in a, a, a test tube, you shake it up, the membranes form, you see soap bubbles above the solution, then they disperse and it goes back uh, into solution. Then you shake it up again, membranes form. So that is what we're talking about with these membranes that are formed in our model systems in our uh, laboratory, and that we think would have occurred on the early Earth. The membranes are not stable. They go between the vesicle structure and then this tri multi structure, and then back to vesicles again when you rehydrate. So that is what we call wet-dry cycling. And it's by far the easiest way to make what we call protocells. So does that answer your question, Elif? Yes, thank you, Professor. Good. Uh, we have another question in the chat. Uh, will the Webb telescope answer questions regarding the great attractor? The great attractor? I mean, like in chaos theory? 
or is that an astronomical attractor? Um, the, I, I don't know, Gert Dennis, can you okay. <laughs> explain? Yeah. Well, in chaos theory, there is a thing called an attractor, but I think the question might have to do with an astronomical phenomenon. Uh, which I've only heard of. I don't know much about uh, how that plays into the story. Uh, you know, I'm not an astronomer, so I probably can't answer that question. Yes, she says it's an uh, astronomical phenomenon. The great attractor is a gravitational alum anomaly in intergalactic space and the apparent central gravitational point of Lineke supercluster. Okay. So that's a little bit beyond my knowledge base. <laughs> uh, she also has continuing questions. Is this telescope capable of imagine, Im imaging uh, Sagittarius A? Can we expect to get more clear photos of our local black hole in the near future? Well, uh, these questions are in another field than my yeah. knowledge base. So those are astronomy questions. And, uh, you know, I won't be able to uh, give much more than what uh, I have just from ordinary reading. I'm sorry, I can't answer that. We have a question coming from AJ. AJ Cullen. Does the, does the shape of the spontaneously formed membrane on atomic levels have a favorable effect or selection on supporting life, or random assembly disassembly is enough for creating protocells. Yes, it's uh, basically a random assembly. So that's a good question. Uh, life began because of selection and amplification. The protocells we make are not alive, but they are a step toward life because they can undergo selection and evolution because of the selection process. Only if we could get them to grow could we have true Darwinian evolution happening. Uh, we have not yet been able to get a growth process in these protocells. So uh, that is what we're trying to do right now. We are trying to get the molecules to replicate uh, by the energy available that we have uh, in a dry, wet cycle. Uh, she says, uh, my internet connection is very bad, by the way. Thanks for the amazing presentation. And it's very nice to learn from you again, says AJ Kalinj. Oh, Thank you very much. I, I enjoy these sessions as well, because there's always things for me to learn now. I have to look up some astronomy questions. So I think uh, I uh, uh, it's probably uh, time to uh, finish up because uh, I have to go get a little breakfast now. <laughs> OK. Uh, uh, if it's all right, maybe they can uh, send you questions to me. Yes, so that, that would be a good thing to do. You have my email address. So please, if you have questions, that's uh, something that I can respond to. Yes, thank you, for Professor, for coming. It was really amazing to have you here. Good. Thank you for the invitation, Elif. It's, it's uh, good to hear from you. Thank you, Professor. And I, we hope to see you again. <laughs> yes, you, you will. Bye-bye.